Um, these are some lecture notes that go with my talk that have all the references that I throw up there and some extra. And it's really for the students to have an uh, introduction to the literature. So I will probably amend the lecture notes after questions today in any discussion. But um, I do suggest that you download it from this website. And it will be on this um, CIDR wiki that's being set up uh, eventually. And it's a Word doc, so if you wanted to type notes into it, you could. Um, but like I said, it's probably not final. And it really is just uh, sort of a running commentary with references. OK, so today I'll be discussing aspects of the giant impact phase of planet formation and trying to relate it to aspects of early Earth that everyone else in the room cares about. And I think, unfortunately, most of my answers will be, we don't know yet. We're working on it, and here are all the problems in between us and the answer. But I will um, show you a lot of movies uh, for the reason of building some intuition on giant impacts. So we want to understand if giant impacts leave some sort of imprint on the early Earth that we can detect today. We want to understand generally how did the Earth form, how did it take, what was the mechanism of assembly, what's the function mass versus time, and then we have hope of calculating the corresponding function of temperature versus time. And we are interested in any in any particular aspects of uh, early accretion that we can record, that we see in the record today, the moon forming impact is the largest example and, any, and the emerging evidence for early chemical differentiation of the Earth that has been preserved to today is the second aspect. And so for this hour, hour and a half discussion, I'll summarize, because I heard questions in the audience yesterday of what is the NIST model and things like that. I'll summarize the general aspects of planet formation. And this is the framework that Dave talked about that's fairly standard. And there are some tweaks to it that are possibly transient or possibly very important that I'll mention. And I want to give you a sense of the state of the art of computational ability. Um, since this is something that should continue to improve rapidly, I'd like to give you a sense of where we are and what future prospects are, and then discuss some open problems. In the handout, I have a jargon section <laughs> um, for things like, what, are, what is a giant impact? <laughs> um, it, and, I, and I didn't throw them up on the slide, but giant impacts themselves are not precisely defined. The easiest way to think about them is impacts between two similarly sized body or the 3D aspect of the problem is important. Um, but people use the term rather loosely. And um, planetesimals is a made up concept of the first solids in the solar system of some unknown size. Protoplanets um, are roughly equivalent to oligarchs. Um, oligarchs are bodies that dominate a particular feeding zone in the solar nebula. So you'll see some of these. Um, in, in the movies of planet formation that I'll show. So in the handout, I have more detailed description of the sequence, the standard sequence of planet formation, the first step being the assembly of the dust and condensed material in the solar nebula that you were introduced to yesterday into planetesimals, these solid building blocks um, of unknown initial size. And this process is basically not understood, um, and yet it is very related to the meteoritic record. And so it's a bit of a problem. Um, as the planetesimals accrete via colliding with each other in a dynamically cold environment, so the relative velocities between bodies are slow. The gas in the solar nebula is a damping force that keeps the relative velocities low. Bodies accrete. And the largest bodies tend to run away in their growth by gravitational focusing effects. And that transitions into a stage that's just termed oligarchy, where the largest bodies dominate a particular annual radius in the solar nebula. And once the mass of the oligarchs exceeds about 
the mass of the smaller bodies left in its feeding zone, the dynamical interactions between oligarchs can be fed. In other words, there are too few planetesimals to damp the largest bodies dynamically, and they start perturbing one another. And that transitions into the stochastic phase of planet formation, which is when giant impacts occur between these planetary embryos or oligarchs. Time scales are 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 for one-way growth. The stochastic giant impact phase of planet formation can last to 100 million years or so, depending on what the giant planets are doing. So during the giant impact phase, these embryos, the basic idea is that these embryos collide to form planets. There are still planetesimals around, and we'll look at that as well, and they are still accreting onto the bodies, and the ratio of material coming from giant impacts, which I could just define as those between embryos as opposed to planetesimals hitting embryos. The fraction of material being accreted from planetesimals versus embryos is very model dependent. Typically, the impact velocities are um, just above the escape velocities, and that's because there's still these planetesimals around to damp the overall um, relative velocities in the system, which leaves you to one, two, two, um, escape velocities being the most frequent impact velocity. Towards the very end stage of planet formation, as the damping forces are cleared, as the planetesimals are cleared, the escape velocities could be much larger, which could lead to things like a Mercury-style event where you have enough energy to potentially strip off a mantle. And that's why um, this period does have diverse outcomes that we are inferred to be in the record of the solar system, where giant impact phase is inferred um, to explain some of the quirks in the solar system. The large core mass fraction of Mercury, one of the leading models is a impact ejection of its mantle. Possibly the retrograde rotation or the fact that the planets rotate in different directions. Um, the formation of Earth's moon. On Mars, there's a dichotomy in crustal thickness that's attributed to a large impact. Um, one could call it giant. It's, it's quite a large event. And the formation of the Pluto system, which now has at least five known moons and will probably have more, and the Haumea system. These are both minor planets, um, not minor planets, uh, dwarf planets in the Kuiper belt <laughs> um, that appear to have a collision origin for their moon system and also possibly for the egg shape of the planet Haumea. Sarah, yeah. Is my author suggesting that one of the things I was talking with Dave about yesterday, oftentimes people go to understand the scale of Oh, uh oh, I'm not gonna remember the radii of everything. Um, Bill wanted to know what the scale of everything was and I'm not going to remember. Uh, the moon is 1.2% Earth mass, <laughs> um, Mercury about 0.055, Mars a tenth Earth mass, and I'm going to totally botch Pluto and Haumea. <laughs> so, okay, small, or comparable, what? Pluto is 10 to the minus 3. Oh. 10 to the minus 3 Earth masses, and Haumea is a little bit smaller. And there are planets out there a little bit bigger than Pluto. Okay. So um, you were introduced to end body simulations of the end stage of planet formation. In these simulations, each particle represents a certain amount of mass, and they have a radius defined by their bulk density. And the system has evolved in time to calculate the orbits of each body and their gravitational influence upon one another. End body simulations um, of the end stage of planet formation between these oligarchs must calculate the gravitational force between every body. So it's an n squared calculation that's extremely time consuming. And you can't parallelize it because you need to calculate the force between every body. Um, for different problems, you can use a gravity tree structure where you can calculate the gravitational forces between groups of bodies, and that takes you to an n log n calculation time. Um, but for the end stage of planet formation, you're basically hosed by the n squared nature of the problem. So the first simulations of the end stage of planet formation only used 10 to 20 planetary embryos and no planetesimals in the problem, and those calculations would take months and months. 
So now we, we um, can do a little better. This plot is semi-major axis versus eccentricity, and this is the terrestrial planets today, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then this is the zone of the asteroid belt, and, v and Jupiter is just off the plot. Okay. So what you'll see is the evolution of planetesimals and embryos over time during planet formation, and you'll see particles move up and down. When they're up, they're dynamically hot, they have a more eccentric orbit. When they collide with one another, they have higher relative velocities. When they're dynamically cold, they're all down near eccentricities of zero. And so the initial state here, I have some notes on this calculation. At the time, this is a 2000, 2006 paper by Raymond. He got some supercomputer time. And he began with, um, almost 2,000 equal mass planetesimals, each a half a moon mass. And this calculation took 16 months of CPU time to run to however it is there. OK. So what he's doing in this, um, per, what the goal of this particular simulation was, was to start with bodies smaller than oligarchs, watch the formation of oligarchs, the interaction of oligarchs to make the final planet. So it's a little bit different from some of the simulations you saw yesterday, where you started with the oligarchs already formed. And you'll see some more of those today. The colors just indicate mixing from different regions. Here to mimic the question of water delivery and radial mixing going into the final planets. And so it's just more water, less water. Um, and that's all the colors. So the color shading will change versus time. And this will run for some millions of years. So they're interacting with one another, merging. So the number of particles are, are decreasing. You see the first embryos grow closer to the sun where the accretion time scales are faster. Um, Jupiter's influence is going to um, kick in. We're going to kick up our time step. And we're going to clear the asteroid belt. This is primarily because of Jupiter. Now there are fewer planetesimals. The embryos are interacting more strongly, and their eccentricities are going up. There's radial mixing as these last water-rich planetesimals are accreted, and all the planets turn a little more blue. And here you end up with a Venus-like, Earth-like, and Mars-like body, although in most of these simulations that have such a large radial region being included in the calculation, Mars is um, more massive than observed. And in most of these simulations, the final eccentricities of Earth and Venus are too high. Okay. Yes? How much of this evolution would have taken or likely have taken place before Jupiter was in place at 5.5 AU? Um, well, uh, Jupiter formed early, early. <laughs> and it about the same processes that these? Well, it, it grew fast enough to then grab um, the mass of the gas, or it grew by instability and grew very quickly before everything else. And so Jupiter is, in, in some of the early simulations, Jupiter would turn on, be magically formed at a million years or so, and most of these simulations begin with Jupiter, and then it's a question of whether they allow Jupiter to migrate, um, or if Jupiter has a circular and eccentric orbit, or if Jupiter is in resonance with Saturn. So there are different so the variations. Not much development in the inner part is relatively immature by the time that Jupiter forms that? Is that the issue? That you have, um, so you would have had the runaway growth to oligarchs contemporaneous with Jupiter formation, depending on how long you think Jupiter formed. So the simplification is that you can assume Jupiter was there for most of the problem. And that you had runaway growth bodies, which could be 10 to 100 kilometers in size. But this is quite model dependent, yeah. Are these time scales here 200 million years consistent with what we heard yesterday? Seems like it's a long time. This one was run a long time to look for late impacts and to basically clear out as, as much as was going to be cleared out. Most are not. Most are run to about 100 million years. But most of what happened, most of the growth is, the growth is early, yes. I'll show some growth profiles in a few minutes. Yes. So when I said that you need to play with the simulation of the simple power, how many times can you go into the next? Um, 
They're in, a, they're in the same plane. They have low but non-zero eccentricity. They're given a very small eccentricity dispersion usually to begin the simulation. And, um, and so you end up with this little, this initiation of runaway accretion in this particular case. In the other cases, when you start with oligarchs and planetesimals, the oligarchs start interacting rather quickly. So, but, yet, but the point that the uh, simulations are sensitive to how init you initialize them is true. And so what um, the planet formation modelers typically do are run sets of simulations and interpret groups of results in some average sense to try and interpret what should be a probable outcome or not. It becomes a probability question. Right? Yes? Um, based upon a conversation we had yesterday and also today, and also Michael's question, I think at some point there are conceptual differences that are not appreciated. For instance, I was watching your model there and at about 50 million years, um, a geochemist might say, you had full formation of the Earth. This is what we would call formation. That is the mass of the body is at 0.6 or 0.7%. Right. So I think when we have this conversation in the room, people may be... Oh, no, no, no. It isn't, it isn't the geo chemical formation time of about two-thirds mass, right? About 0.6 mass, is that what you use? Something <laughs> on that one, two-thirds mass. Right, and, and it's because the, when we get to the profiles, you see that they look exponential. And what we're looking at here at the 200 million, 100 to 200 million year time frame are the stochastic last events where most of the modelers are doing this to look for moon formation type events, since that is expected to be late. So that's why these are run so late. I'm never going to finish this talk. <laughs> I'm there. Yes. Well, I'm Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. <laughs> I will. I will show. Mar I will. Sh I will show Mars-ish type things in a minute. Is, uh, is there any indication from the colors here where the Right, and so these are more blue, and then they had a larger contribution from further out in the in the. Um, Solar nebula, and this is a little more green. There are there are papers that have histograms of the original location of different materials to to address questions of late accretion and water content, and those again all depend on how you've initialized. But they're in papers, Barbara. <laughs> so um, in all but one <laughs> end body simulation. <laughs> Essentially, all, all but one published work. Um, whenever two bodies collide, they are assumed to merge perfectly. And I will show you, if I get there, in exquisite detail how that's not the, the only outcome. But um, you can imagine that if there were debris creating many n bodies, you would never finish this calculation. So we have a technical limitation on what we can do with calculating the messy part of planet formation that the meteoritists care about. So <laughs> that, um, unless, the debris is small, unless the debris is very small. Okay, so I'm going to breeze through a couple of things we've already mentioned. The initial conditions matter. And so for more recent work, they try to mimic the distribution of um, larger embryos that form, which generally are between moon to Mars mass and some population of planetesimals. The planetesimals, um, in this case, 97 embryos in 1,000 planetesimals, this is not calculable in a full n squared simulation with our computing power today. So the 97 embryos are fully interacting. They perturb each other and all the planetesimals. The planetesimals are called non-interacting in that they do not interact with each other. Um, and they just accrete, and they don't, uh, and they, but they do per perturb the embryos. And so they, planetesimals primarily act as what's called dynamical friction in damping the, um, the embryos, but they don't interact with each other, and in many cases they would collide with each other and, and erode. Um, and there would be a size distribution of these bodies, but for computational limitations, they're modeled as a single mass. Okay, 
Um, but in this sort of initial condition, we are mimicking the transition to oligarchy where about half the mass is in the embryos and half the mass is in the planetesimals. And this is a slightly more realistic starting condition, except that all these embryos would not have formed at the same time, and yet you're initializing the simulation assuming that they're all there already. And so you are missing uh, aspects of the transition between runaway growth and oligarchy and the, and the final stage. And I'm just very noisy. Let me try this out. And, um, and the, the different components of planet formation and their references in the notes are different codes that are used for studying the formation of planetesimals, the runaway growth to oligarchy, and then the final stochastic phase. And these are computational limitations that will need to be overcome to really capture planet formation. So this is an example of um, the outcome after starting with this um, mixture of embryos and planetesimals. So again, higher eccentricity is more dynamically excited. So here at 0.01 million years with Jupiter and Saturn are in all of these calculations, but only Jupiter is shown. Um, Jupiter is exciting the embryos and planetesimals nearest it, and over time, they in turn excite um, the f ones further in. These bodies are colliding and merging and growing, and again, color-coded for this proxy for water. Um, and we do have significant growth here in the 10 million year time frame that you are looking for. Um, and I forget, oh, right, so I skipped a step, 10 million growth. And then in the end, we, look, we have something that looks similar to Venus, Earth, Mars-like, and some asteroid belt. So this is uh, basically a state-of-the-art model outcome. As Dave said yesterday, the giant planets are everything. And that will become more apparent when I get to the Nice model. Um, the giant planets are controlling the dynamics of the rocky zone near the sun. And that has a powerful influence on the time scale of accretion and the final masses of the bodies. All, and so this last plot should demonstrate that if there were no Jupiter, you know, there would be a, a, a big planet here, which has been known for a long time that Jupiter's influence has prevented a, a large body from growing in that zone. So here's some mass versus time plots from that same paper. Um, log time. So here's our 10 million years, 100 million years. The gray bar is the range of times for moon, forming, moon formation. So they're looking for a giant impact in that time window. And the growth profiles have these jumps in them that are the giant impacts and sometimes more slow growth that are the planetesimals accreting. And these are just the bodies at different, the final bodies at different distances, just to give you an exact. So now you're used to looking at this not in log x-axis, and then it looks like an exponential. OK. So I think the time scale is about right for what people know of core formation time and uh, the last impact. Now. Um, in 2005, a new model was introduced for the giant planets in the solar system. And the, obser the puzzling observation was that the giant planets have non-zero eccentricities and inclinations, which means they were somehow excited. And yet they formed in this gas disk to get their gas envelopes. And so one would have predicted that they would have formed with zero eccentricities and low inclinations. And that's not what was seen. And so there needed to be some way to excite all of the giant planets. And um, a group of workers based at, uh, including a cluster based at the Nice Observatory, hence the name the Nice model, um, proposed that the, this is time, that, and just this is semi-major axis, and the range is the perihelion, aphelion differences. Uh, distances. So proposed initially in an ad hoc sense and then later justified it by um, gas-driven migration in the early solar system that all four giant planets were in a much more compact configuration early on and that there was a cold disk of icy planetesimals beyond, in this case, what ends up being Uranus, and that planetesimal-driven migration after the gas disk disappeared led to the very slow outward migration of these bodies. 
And then at some time, Saturn and Jupiter reach two to one mean motion resonance. Mean motion resonance is one goes around once while the other goes around twice in their orbits around the sun. And that led, leads to, uh, the mean motion resonance leads to increase of eccentricity and dynamical excitation between the four bodies and a very rapid outward expansion of all the, of the outer planets, and in this case, switching locations, and then being reestablished into uh, near their present locations. So when people say the Nice model, fundamentally they're referring to the outward migration of the giant planets, and in this case through uh, mean motion resonance that excited all of them. And that explains the general architecture of the giant planets in the solar system. And now there are many additions to the niche models or subsequent parts um, that uh, come and go. Um, some will stick around and some are a matter of debate. But since 2005, this particular aspect of the model has held up to scrutiny and is the generally accepted um, evolution of the giant planets. Um, so hot Jupiters are giant planets that have migrated into their star. We observe many of them around other stars, so many exoplanets, and the first ones that were found were, were hot Jupiters. So their, Jupiter, their Jupiters migrated in, um, <coughs> probably through gas-driven migration. And it's possible that Jupiter did that here. That's the Grand Tack model, which is a couple slides away. Um, and uh, the big question was why do they stop and not, the hot Jupiters, why do they stop and not plummet into their star? And I don't know the answer. Do you know the answer? <laughs> I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, That's not really relevant for Earth formation, but, but there is a range of giant planet configurations found in exoplanetary systems. Uh, migration seems to be very common among gas giants. So that you should take, that, that you should know. Yes? That seemed like a very strong statement. Which part? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Right. The Nice, the nice model is this ever-moving definition, and so um, so the details change. And they, 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 since the 2005 paper, published a paper where they modeled formation of the gas giants and their migration inward to a more compact configuration. So their initial conditions are slightly different, but no longer ad hoc. And, um, and they've been working, uh, testing their model with the observations of the dynamics of mostly the small bodies in the solar system. So, How do you mean this is not ad hoc? Um, meaning that they have a model for how to bring the four giant planets into an initially compact configuration. So for the 2005 paper, they just posited, let's pretend that this was the case of the giant planets. And people criticized them heavily for it at the time. But since then, they have come up with a natural mechanism, okay, so which you could debate. Inter yes. Machine, right. No well, you, we're, the way that the dynamics of the giant planets are tested is to look at what should have happened in their sculpting of the small bodies. So the record in the asteroid belt, the record in Trojan moons, the record in the Kuiper belt are the dynamical tests and the first evidence for migration. First evidence for the migration of Neptune was really the record of the Kuiper belt. I think that's right. Rainu Malhotra's work. You don't agree. <laughs> I am simplifying a lot of planet formation. <laughs> There is. The details are all up for grabs, but the general idea that the giant planets moved around in our solar system is commonly expect, accept, accepted, and maybe there are still people who don't think they moved at all, but I think it's hard to argue that Neptune didn't move. And the question is how much did the inner planets move? Okay, but, but yeah, okay, students, it is, it, it, planet formation is not a known, known problem. <laughs> It is, it is rapidly evolving, and this was a very big change to our way of thinking, which has been widely adopted. But I, I also, yes, yes. You may never get through your talk. No. <laughs> um, I'm just looking at the time scales here, and also the commonly repeated phrase that the Nice model helps explain the late heavy bombardment. Right. And it, it looks like by 100 million years, 
in, in the previous graph, everything is settled down already. Uh, 100, oh, here, yes. Time zero is arbitrary in this plot. OK, but, but I'm, I'm looking on the, the right hand side. Right? By 100 million years, <coughs> things look pretty, pretty, much, right? they pretty much achieved. The, the giant planets settle back into a stable configuration rather quickly. Right. So um, one of the add-ons to the Nice model, commonly wrapped up in describing the Nice model but doesn't have to be, um, is the idea that the, uh, this event did not occur until about 3.9 billion years ago to be coincident with the observed late heavy bombardment um, in the inner solar system, also known as the lunar cataclysm. In my notes, I have some comments about how the late heavy bombardment is not a continuation of primary accretion, that there must be a hiatus, a gap in time in collision flux before the uh, late heavy bombardment, and that has to do with how you just can't keep particles around in the solar system throughout that time period. Um, and so what they did was they tweaked in the original papers. So this uh, paper came out. There were, there were a trio of papers that came out with the original model. You have your compact, this is a top-down view of the solar system in uh, astronomical units, so the inner planets are all in here. So you have the orbits of the four giant planets, and exterior to them you have a cold disk of planetesimals that's just hanging out in the outer solar system. And um, over time, the, uh, the planets, the outer planets scatter the planetesimals inward and move outward slightly. And so over time, they slowly drift outwards until they have this resonance crossing. And this is right before the resonance crossing. And here is right after um, it started. They have now, the giant planets have temporarily quite eccentric orbits. The cold disk of planetesimals and the asteroid belt, which is not in this picture, um, were heavily uh, disrupted, not disrupted, dynamically scattered and depleted by either being accreted onto something, the sun, or, or thrown out of the solar system. And then that event then would lead to the basins that we see on the rocky planets in the inner solar system. And then um, afterwards, you clear out. You have the Kuiper belt left in the outer solar system and some fraction of the asteroid belt. In the original paper, um, the, this, the properties of this outer belt were tweaked so that you could get this um, planet crossing event happening um, at 3.9 million years. But it uh, didn't have to happen that way. It could have happened earlier. And the, and the late heavy bombardment is something else. But then the something else is not known. So this is currently a widely accepted explanation for the late heavy bombardment, but it isn't um, necessarily the right answer. Yes? I'd just like to make a comment. And it's <laughs> to a talk I'll be giving later in the week. But this is a useful reference frame, because what I'll talk about is the building blocks of planet Earth. And our reference frame is Conrite. We have a couple of different varieties. We use names like anthracite and carbonaceous. But remember that all the samples we got have come to Earth in the last half million years, and all this happened beforehand. So when we're trying to reconstruct within a planet, you can think about some of these things being tossed around and how much we don't know in terms of the initial building blocks. Yeah. And, and materials being scattered in and out. And so the or original location in the solar nebula is also ambiguous for a lot of bodies. Um, the one of the nice side, side aspects of the Nice model is that um, some of these bodies that are originally beyond the giant planets gets injected into the outer asteroid belt. And people like to think that they're sort of comet-like bodies as part of the asteroid belt to help explain the compositional diversity of the asteroid belt. So that is a, another side effect. So um, I mentioned before that. Uh, the typical, the standard end body simulations of terrestrial planet formation produce a Mars that is too massive. And so there is a proposal to explain the um, small mass of Mars, and it involves even more antics with the giant planets. And this is called the Grand Tack model, which was published um, last year in Nature. And here is schematically what Jupiter and Saturn are doing. This is early in time. This is before the Nice outward migration of the planets. This is a precursor event. Okay. 
And so um, orbital distance, this is the path of Jupiter and the path of Saturn. Um, one or more of the authors are sailing phonetics and <laughs> named uh, the model after changing direction called a tack in sailing. And so Jupiter is changing direction. And what's happening here is you have gas-driven migration of Jupiter inward towards the sun. It would keep going until something stopped it in this and destroy the terrestrial planet zone. In this case, the, the delayed growth of Saturn compared to Jupiter um, means that uh, Saturn's gravitational uh, interactions with Jupiter are slightly delayed. Saturn also would begin to migrate inward. And then these two would get caught in resonance and switch directions in a way that Morby can explain quite easily and I can't remember. But switch directions so they start migrating outward. And then they hang out in their compact configuration until the nebula disappears. This is all happening when there's a nebular gas present. The nebula disappears and then later, 600 million years later, you have the late heavy bombardment and the outward migration of the giant planets. So this is a precursor model. The effect of having an inward migration of Jupiter is to truncate the annulus that grows the final terrestrial planets. And so when we say that the growth of terrestrial planets is controlled by the giant planets, <laughs> this is another aspect of, of their effects, um, which is a new model um, that that has two papers out about it. And here the, is this n-body simulation. Um, again, eccentricity starting with the cold planetesimal disk and embryos. The open circles are embryos. The dots are planetesimals. And the Saturn, the not fully grown, I mean Jupiter, the not fully grown Saturn, zero. This is a very fast process in the presence of the gas disk. So not plotted is the presence of the gas disk. 70,000 years later, Jupiter has migrated inward, excited and depleted a region down to 2 AU here. Some of the embryos have become excited. Some of them are merging. And we're scattering these bodies that were exterior to Jupiter in blue um, inward and some are implanted in the inner solar system and scattering bodies initially inward to Jupiter outward. And Saturn is growing and does it, the grand tack catches up with it and starts pulling it back 100,000 years. And after that, we've depleted the, um, the disk of planetesimals basically to 1 AU. And then um, these planetesimals and embryos interact with one another. There are enough planetesimals to damp the embryos again so that they can grow in a more orderly fashion, more similar to what we've seen already, but just in a truncated disk, 500,000 years. And then here at 600,000 years um, is what's left in the asteroid belt. The, um, the bottom panel are separate calculations than the top panels. And it's just an example of one of their best cases with reproducing the inner planets um, after the Grand Tack. And then one of their best cases in reproducing the remnant asteroid belt um, ran out to 600,000 years. So, um, so there's a superposition of, of models. But, but much later, you end up forming the final planets than this whole process. So this is all very early on, very fast. Yes? Is, is this uh, easy to do? I mean, like, if they do this calculation <laughs> 10 times, do you get this outcome half the time? Or is it they have a plot of uh, the distribution of planets that they created from some number of runs. And you do end up with Venus Earth-like planets easily, and enough cases that look like Mars, that the idea that truncating the disk would lead to a truncated Mars is directly related. Um, Mars, in this case, is, is an embryo. So its growth rate is in the first few, few million years, one to three million years, is the uh, main accretion of this body. And then it's essentially an embryo that diffused, dynamically diffused, out of that annulus. And there were no planetesimals left in that zone to accrete. And so that's how Mars growth is fast. It's essentially just the embryo without much happening later and, and kept its mass at about an embryo mass. And that would be consistent with the tungsten hafnium age for Mars. Okay, Mercury similarly is a diffusive small body inward. 
but no one has tried to explain the iron content as part of this because they're not doing anything that would change the mantle core fraction. Yes? Um, a comment about what I think is the central uncertainty in these stories, both this one and more generally, it has to do with the formation of the giant planets. We do not know the precise timing and the relative timing of the formation of the giant planets. This is a poorly understood area. So you have to understand that when stories like this are put together, there is an arbitrariness that those guys insert about when Saturn grows to its full size relative to the stage of growth of Jupiter. Those are put in by hand because these people are not actually making Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And this is a major problem in the field. Uh, I've worked on this problem, although not recently. But what I know about it is that one of the main problems is opacity. It turns out that the aggregation of gas on the new bodies depends on the opacity of the medium because it has to get rid of energy. And this is unfortunately just one of those things where it's very hard to uh, make progress. You can put in a number and get out something, but, but you don't really know whether Jupiter took three million years or five or two, uh, and you don't know why it is that Saturn grew a little bit later. You don't even know for sure why Saturn truncates its growth at the size it does. So there, and that has to do with the properties of the disk. So there are, unfortunately, some still some very major uh, unresolved issues in this field. The, the lifetime of the gas, that's also uh, a bit uncertain. Uh, I think there's crews in Japan that say that it lasts for much longer than everybody else. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again? The lifetime of the gas. What is the lifetime of the nebular gas? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, so, uh, so sure. I mean, that's a truncation. You can't build these planets when the nebula is gone. Although it does turn out that if you lower the density of the nebula, uh, by a factor of 10, say, they can still grow. Um, it actually is not highly sensitive to the density of gas in the nebula, um, except towards the end. So you can, so, so another part of the uncertainty is actually related to observation. And that is the way in which the nebula is lost back at the interstellar medium. Is it sort of lost gradually, or is it truncated? in a very sharp fashion so that you could say, yes, in three million years, the nebula is gone and there's nothing left in the gas phase. That matters. I know. I don't know what we're <laughs> We're going to keep going into the next half hour, right? <laughs> the questions have happened through yes. the talk. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> so along the same lines, is there any reason to assume there are only uh, two giant gas planets, uh, Saturn and Jupiter there? Could there be more? And then they kind of collide with each other and then something disappears. Um, what happens if you put I don't know. I, I, well, at some point, they're, they're not going to be stable, and they, they will collide or eject one another. But I don't know. I think Morby has tried the Grand Tech with five, not the, uh, the Nice model general outward migration with five planets. Some number of times that lasts and becomes stable. I don't think more fit in our particular solar system. Um, I just want to say that there are, I, in the notes, there are links to some more movies about the, the Grand Tech, just so you get a sense of what it's doing. But I, I put it in to, to just emphasize that the giant planets are sculpting the terrestrial planet zone. And here is another mass versus time plot with the Grand Tech of the largest body. So this would be the Earth-like body. Um, and to show its accretion profile, now not in logs, so you can see your 60 percent forming in uh, you know the roughly the 10 million year time frame and then what 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 you're supposed to notice about this is um, the jumps are quite different the giant impacts are quite different and so Morby just gave a plenary talk at Goldschmidt where he said that the the frequency of giant impacts is now much more variable there are cases like the black line where you almost have none um, cases like the dash line where you have a very big one, almost two equal mass bodies colliding rather late. And then um, 
a quite different sequence, not necessarily a late one, and late ones became less frequent compared to the standard model. So you could take this as meaning we don't know anything or we should think of everything and <laughs> consider everything in terms of planet growth patterns and the number and nature of giant impacts. <laughs> okay, which I'm trying to get to. Yes. <laughs> Right. The dynamic, right. The dynamical friction. In this case, um, it's before oligarchs formed. The Grand Tack would be before oligarchs formed, probably, and um, and so there are more planetesimals. So you have these seeds of runaway growth, say, that um, after the Grand Tack, they're excited, but now there's so many planetesimals that they all dynamically damp each other down. During that excitation, though, any collisions would be quite energetic and would basically be erosive. Um, but the, that's not included in these simulations. So I don't know if I'm answering. Yes, it depends on do they do they have enough? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Right, so um, this goes back to the earlier statement that the final planets have too high eccentricity in most of these simulations, and would that be solved if you just added many, many more planetesimals than we can handle today with our computers? And I would say maybe, probably, um, but we'll see. <laughs> yes, so I think that's an easy way to anticipate a solution to that problem. Okay. Um, this is a question from Bill yesterday. What is the accretion efficiency of the n-body accretion process? This is a plot. I've annotated what all these variables are in the handout, but all that you need to look at is F sub A, which is the fraction of material in the initial annulus that remained in planets in the initial annulus afterwards. So this is basically of the material going into Venus and Earth. Uh, how much of the original material made it into Venus and Earth, or how much more material, if you invert it, how much more material do you need to start with than uh, to make the planets we see today? So the, this particular study began with just embryos, no planetesimals, and they found that about 80% of the embryo mass ended up in the final planets. The rest are... Um, it, ejected out of the zone, some lost and some just out of the zone. And this is, a, this is a table from a simulation that began with both embryos and planetesimals. And so fate of the planetesimals, and this is a circular orbit Jupiter-Saturn, eccentric orbit Jupiter-Saturn, and you see that about half are actually lost rather than accreted. Um, but then the other half is mostly accreted and then you have some large scattering. And so. It's not perfect accretion in the zone. Um, but, and then for embryos, this is a comparable number to the previous, previous plot. Yes? So one would, in, from a geochemist perspective, the question really would be, is the, let's say half the loss, is that very early? Or is yeah. the loss yeah. the late? Because the late loss mm. is much more geochemically interesting than an early loss. Uh, but you're thinking ejecta. Are you thinking whatever's there? So this, this is, of course, just initial planetesimals and their final fate. OK. Um, yes? Where's the loss going? What do you mean, where's the loss going? That's <laughs> they're ejected from the <laughs> um, So some, if a material, so typically in these simulations, if a material is thrown out of the semi-major axis of the annulus they care about, then they forget it. If it's going to intercept the sun, they forget it. Um, and so something interesting could happen later to bring it back, but for the purpose of these calculations, it's ejected. Oh, hi. <laughs> we should be 
asking him for <laughs> explaining everything. OK. So finally, <clears throat> we will talk about aspects of individual giant impacts. Um, OK. So there are two aspects that I, I arbitrarily defined the problem into two components. One is what I call mechanics. You could think of it as dynamics. It means um, in these simulations, body A hits body B at some impact velocity, at some impact angle. You have some mass ratio between the bodies. And you want to know what happens by what happens is do they merge? Do they destroy each other? What's the final mass? What's the size distribution and velocity distribution of fragments? This would be what you would need to reinsert into your planet formation calculation if you were considering the physical outcome of each collision rather than the current assumption of perfect merging. OK, so we were trying um, to develop um, an, a, a way of, of explaining the mechanics of the outcome and we'd like to know what the probability of different kinds of outcomes are. Second uh, aspect, um, the thermodynamics of the problem, where we'd like to know how much was melted, how much was vaporized, um, the time scale of the event, mixing, any implications for chemistry. And I'll just say, we know how to do this. We don't know how to do that, right? Not well, anyway. Um, and so what we'd like is some easy function. Uh, with few variables, and you just plug them in, and you get kicked back out a number. So in a paper that came out this year, we developed such an easy function. If I, I have a link to the online JavaScript calculator that will let you play with giant impacts to see what the outcomes are. And I'm going to end up breezing through some parts of that. We'd like a similarly easy function, few impact variables, and spit out something like the increase in entropy of the Earth after a giant impact. We don't have this, and it's not going to be a a simple problem. Um, we are, in principle, working on it. Um, but odds are that um, it will have lots of subtlety to it. So no, the next is gravity. <laughs> the dominant force over here is gravity. Um, and that makes it a really easy problem. And here. Um, we have annoying things like the equation of state and the geometry of the problem leading to very different total energy deposited into the target and things like that. Um, we haven't modeled solid planets in this regime. All the models current to date are assuming pure hydrodynamic planets, which is also incorrect. So um, we have not done enough work to know where we can draw the line of things we know we can safely ignore for the questions we want to answer related to the chemistry, for example. And over here, I think we've done lots and lots of people, decades of papers, have done enough work to know where we can draw the line in what we include and don't include more safely. Okay. All right. Um, I already said this. So uh, I'll show you some movies. <laughs> it's time for more movies. These particular movies are like um, what people showed yesterday. They're smooth particle hydrody hydrodynamics calculations of giant impacts. Smooth particle hydrodynamics is a Lagrangian method where each particle, now we're, now we're in another particle code. You need to forget everything about n-body codes and now switch gears. These are different kind of particle code. Each particle represents a fixed amount of mass and the um, Interactions between particles are calculated, including the force of gravity, including uh, equations of state that allow calculations of compression, expansion, and shock processes. And the um, one of the things you need to know about smooth particle hydrodynamics is, as the name implies, the um, particles have no fixed size, and the uh, effective Diameters involve smoothing um, multiple particles in what's called a kernel function. And that can include 64 to 100 particles in this smoothing volume. And so it's an inherently rather low resolution calculation. But um, be, in this type of calculation, the gravitational forces can be calculated using a gravity tree. So it's n log n. So you can run a million particle SPH calculation where you can't run a million particle direct and body planet formation calculation. And that's just because you're, you're calculating the interaction between groups of particles. 
But a million particles, most calculations are 10 to the 5 particles. You're talking about 30 particles across your planet, and they're smoothed over h to 10 in, in a given length scale, so it's very low resolution. OK. Um, there are Eulerian codes, grid-based codes, that are starting to be used more frequently. This is being developed for giant impacts um, by David Crawford and Robert Knupp. Um, and, and I've run a few giant impact cases with it. And there are, um, for slower velocity impacts where the, um, there's no melting or vaporization, you could use different types of codes as well. OK, so smooth particle hydrodynamics codes. Um, in this case, the simulations are perfectly hydrodynamic, no re re rheological model, no shear strength. And when people explored parameter space, with different styles of impact, we saw different categories of outcomes. And I, we've given them names, perfect merging, partial accretion, partial erosion, and then something called hit and run and graze and merge. And here is an a impact similar to the accretion of the moon, uh, 0.9 M Earth planet, a little bit bigger than Mars, 9 kilometers per second at 45 degrees. This is similar to. Not exactly, but, but similar. We, we ran it. The colors are just materials, cores and mantles. And there's time going up in the corner. This is three hours, four hours, six hours. And it looks basically done, 10, 12. We have a bunch of debris. And so here's the last clump that's going to impact at some point. This is a view. This is a slice through the three-dimensional problem of the lower hemisphere. So you're looking at a slice through the center of the Earth and half the disk, top down. And even though these look like discrete particles, you cannot think of them that way. You have to smooth the whole thing, because this is being averaged with the nearest 64 particles around it, um, that this is really a smooth distribution. And all the particle masses are the same density, so the number of particles is a proxy for the density difference in the, in the, in the disk, in this case, versus um, the, the planet. And what you see is that the core material sort of stretches out wraps around, plummets through the mantle because there's no strength. And most of the projectile uh, material is heated to the point where it has lower density. And during the gravitational re-equilibration of the body, the hotter, less dense portions of the mantle material just float to the surface, float, readjust, <laughs> we gravitationally readjust to be dominating near the surface. And there's an atmosphere, and et cetera. Yes, well, question? Scatter distance. Scatter distance. What do you mean scatter distance? Oh, sorry. Well, uh, the Roche limit beyond which where uh, a moon can form within which uh, tidal, the moon would be tidally disrupted by the Earth is just under three Earth radii, present Earth radii. I was looking at this a lot like you can't help but imagine that a portion of any reservoir at the core of a mountain mountain would be sheared off and disrupted. Um, uh, I'll show uh, something to address that directly later. Um, so we are, of course, interested in uh, perhaps radial mixing, the, the distribution of energy being dumped in. Uh, in the re-equilibrated state, the, there is preferential energy deposition in the surface. But that's just because that's where that material ended up. But those were in the impacted hemispheres, originated from the impacted hemispheres of the bodies. And I'll show you that in a minute. Hold on. Let me try. Uh, no, so the formation of the moon and SPH, SPH particles, SPH models um, will run into uh, increased errors with time in modeling the disk because it's an artificial viscosity and not a real viscosity. It's not a real model of the disk. And so in comparison, sensitivity tests a day or two after the event um, is about the longest one would attempt to believe anything. Um, and so what we have is the disk from which the moon forms after the impact, and then the process of forming the moon from the disk is very complicated, as Dave, and, um, and could take a long time because it takes a while to cool. OK, um, I'm just going to show you more examples. So catastrophic disruption is when you hit fast enough that you um, achieve escape velocities in the, ener in the vo momentum imparted into uh, fragments. And this is a big debris cloud. Um, and we've stripped off a portion of the mantle, not quite enough in this case. So this is 
work in prep, but this is basically like Willie Benz's 2007 uh, review paper on Mercury. You start with a body about twice the mass of Mercury and hit it with about a tenth the size body rather quickly. Um, some of his solutions are a good deal faster. And, but look at the time. Here we are. We're a few hours later. I cannot figure out how to do this. So 0.2 hours, and we've pancaked the planet with a head-on collision, which is not the most likely one, but I don't have a pretty off-axis one to show you. But by, by two hours, we've gravitationally reaccumulated the cores, and um, the outward expansion is switched direction to be more inward, and we're now reaccreting. So the time scales of these events, you know, the characteristic time scales are hours, several hours or less, depending on what exactly we're doing. Do you know how long it takes to average the people? 10 to the 5 particles on a reasonable cluster is quite tractable. Yeah. Meaning, depending on, you know, depending on how many cores you have, but not many cores, you can run it in a day or two. And then if you really, then if you need longer or whatever. Okay. Um, this is a uh, graze and merge. Graze and merge um, is uh, an event that occurs close to the escape velocity uh, for an oblique impact. And um, a little bit faster, and the two bodies would escape in a hit and run, a little bit slower, and there would be direct merging. And so here the bodies separate. So this is this initial grazing, and but they're gravitationally captured and then uh, merge to form uh, in this case, elongated body, it has high angular momentum. Graze and merge events are events that impart high angular momentum because they're primarily accretionary off-axis events that lead to high spin. And um, this particular model proposed that the moons around Haumea were spun off um, portions of the icy mantle. because The moons are quite icy as well. And the rocky cores merged. And this, this um, problem was actually addressed with both hydrodynamic and uh, uh, a rheological model of, of this type event with similar results. Okay, graze and merge. And then um, hit and run is what it sounds like. You hit a little faster and you graze, but now the um, second body still has escape, uh, has escape velocity. And, but it, the smaller body, or the second body in this case, um, was more disrupted, if you notice. Um, but the original one has about its original mass. Okay. So we have these different classes of outcomes. Now, um, you've seen that they are geometrically distinct, and they are distinct in, in energy regime, differences that just scale with velocity at the same impact. So you can imagine that the thermal deposition into the planet is different, which is why that function for how much entropy increases is, is more complicated. Now that we have sort of a framework to address that problem with, I think we might begin to get some traction. I am going to skip this. Should I skip this? Should I skip this or not? What do you think? <laughs> um, I was going to explain a little bit about how, we, all right, I'll do it quickly. I'll try. OK. Um, as I mentioned, we have an analytic out, a set of equations. It's very simple. It's six or seven equations that tell you the outcome of a particular impact. And there are two material parameters that we fit to a bunch of um, numerical simulations. And the most important factors are the mass ratio and the impact velocity. These two parameters, these two parameters describe the catastrophic disruption curve, if you're familiar with that. Catastrophic disruption is a term that means um, after the impact, half the total mass remains. That's just as opposed to partial disruption. OK. And so all that is is a reference line to determine how much erosion occurred. And so I'm going to show you uh, a plot of um, phase space. So we have impact angle. And it's based by equal probability. So a quarter of all impacts happen between 0 and 30 degrees and 30 and 45. So it's not equal in units. It's equal in probability. And then we have scaled impact velocity, impact velocity over the escape velocity. And here we're looking at uh, a wide range, much wider than most of uh, planet formation, is much lower. And it's just to illustrate the erosive outcomes. So here are contours of the mass of the largest remnant in units of, in this case, the target mass for a 1 to 10. So this would be a Mar um, Mars hitting an Earth. And 
the impact velocity you need in terms of mutual escape velocity to reach a tenth of the, fin of the Earth as your final remnant is, is tremendously high, as you would expect, for a head-on impact. And then as you increase the impact angle, the required energy goes up because there's less material actually hitting at some point and less energy is being imparted into the target to disrupt it because you're hitting it obliquely and not all of the mass is intersecting. Okay, so these are contours of final mass. Um, and here's the boundary. We're below the, this line, um, the target mass um, grows or something else happens. And the growing happens, net accretion. So this white space is all net erosion. And you can imagine contours of final mass. And then at head-on impacts, you would have net accretion below it. But for oblique impacts, you transition from having enough energy to erode the target to these hit and run events. And this occurs, the boundary here occurs roughly when the center of the projectile, the smaller body, misses the target. And then the gravitational self-gravity of each body keeps them roughly intact. They hit, they may trade a bit of mass and then they keep going, okay. And that's hit and run. That's, and this is a, a simplification of the complex space, but it's a pretty good estimate. As you go to lower impact velocities, you have this region of graze and merge where you hit separate but are bound and come back again. Okay. And then below one mutual escape velocity, you have perfect merging essentially. Okay, so that's this. And this is all described by a set of equations and it's on the website in the notes. Yes? But if you have a walking planet or ice planet, this change, right? Um, the, per the parameter for disruption changes a little, but for many types of bodies that have been modeled, uh, oh, oh the, these, these, um, these outcomes apply to the gravity regime. Bodies greater than a kilometer in size. We've modeled it, we and others have modeled it um, from about a kilometer in size up to super Earths with the general outcomes being the same and this is just a reflection of the fact that it's gravity dominated rather than dominated by material properties. Um, and so for small bodies with some actual strength or interesting rheology, you do require a little bit more energy to disrupt than for fluid hot planets. Okay, but the difference is small compared to the scale of this plot. Okay, so I'm just putting on some uh, familiar giant impacts to help orient you. The moon lies here near the transition between an oblique impact that just merges and one that grays and merges. Mercury, these are um, Benz 2007, this is Knopp. Um, these are example mercury stripping impacts that are basically at catastrophic disruption, half the total mass remains. and the basically explains things that you, the range of outcomes. We don't, of course, see hit and runs um, anymore being recorded. Okay, the, the, this map, we call it a collision map, this parameter space map of outcomes depends on the mass ratio because that moves the boundary between um, more head-on events and uh, grazing events, and that's just a geometric effect of the relative radii of the two bodies. And so as you go towards more extreme mass ratios or smaller projectiles, you don't have this graze and grazing regime. You just have erosion or accretion. And as you go to more similarly sized bodies like the end stage of planet formation, you have much larger green area. Okay. And then we can quantify this. <coughs> by um, trying to come up with a probability of each outcome during terrestrial planet formation. And so what, I, what we did was we took um, a couple of published works of terrestrial planet formation that included embryos and planetesimals, and we analyzed all of their impact parameters. And they had assumed perfect merging, and we said, well, what would have been the more physical outcome? Okay. So this particular study ha had 40 different n-body simulations. Of all the n-body simulations, the 161 planets were formed of various masses, a total of 1,100 giant impacts in these 40 simulations, so we have reasonable statistics. It's an average of many giant planet configurations, um, but we're just trying to get a sense of what, what should have been happening. 
And so instead of perfect merging, we found that the outcomes were roughly split between partial accretion, graze and merge, and hit and run. And the dominance of these grazing outcomes is a reflection of the fact that we're talking about similar sized bodies. And the lack of erosive events is a reflection of the fact that the velocities are rather low, just above escape velocity. And so here's a distribution histogram of the, number, the fraction of giant impacts and the impact velocity. All giant impacts over the entire course of accretion peak just above one. And the last giant impact, as I mentioned, as you're clearing things out, has a wider distribution and can achieve higher relative velocities in the standard model. So more interesting things could happen, like mercury. OK. Um, now, I'm going to do a trick. And I'm going to take this velocity probability distribution and scale the y-axis on my collision outcome plot. So the, this plot, again, has a scaled by probability x-axis. And now I've scaled by probability the y-axis. So the peak of the distribution is just above 1, the escape. And then there's a tail that goes up to 6, but you can't see it because it's such a small area of the plot. So now, the ratio of different colored regions of the plot is proportional to the probability of that collision outcome. OK? So what should jump out at you is the likelihood of partial accretion. And this is accreting about 25% of the projectile, not all of it. Graze and merge, where you end up accreting most of the mass, but in this rather gentle high angular momentum way. And giant impact simulations do imply high angular momentum for a lot of outcomes. And hit and run. Now, over time, the hit and run bodies are slowed down, and there's a likelihood that they will come back and hit again and either end up merging or scattering each other um, and merge in, in one of these regimes. So these end up coming back. But in terms of just the Number of impacts, this is a map. And erosion is still possible. Catastrophic disruption is this thick line. So this would be a mercury-style event. It's still probable. It's not, it's a probable at the percent level that you could have an erosion event. Mercury-style is still a low probability event, but it's not absent from the figure. Any questions about this? Yes, I have, uh, in the first, first version of this, this was a linear axis. And in this version, I have stretched the y-axis so that the spacing is proportional to probability. OK? OK, so perfect merging is a poor approximation for giant impact outcomes during the end stage of planet formation. There should be lots of debris. Yes? Yes. Yes, so zero, the 30 and 20 and 15 spacing is just the fact that a quarter of all impacts lie between here, a quarter of all impacts lie between here. It's sine theta, cosine theta of impact angle is probability distribution from Shoemaker. But the the they approach each other. Is included. Is, 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 is the same. <laughs> yeah, the gravitational focusing leads to the same probability distribution. OK, so um, a little more about quasi-compositional effects. One can look at, um, I took the probability distribution of impact parameters and ran a simple Monte Carlo planet growth calculation. So I didn't run an n-body code. I just said, I know the probability of everything happening, and I'm going to grow a planet and grow 200 planets and see what I get. Okay. So I, I, I've try to reproduce the distribution of 161 planets from the uh, original n-body simulations. And in this case, if a body hit and run, I assumed it came back again. I just slowed it down a little and, and had a random uh, impact angle. And I didn't recreate any debris. So the first thing that one can calculate is um, the erosion of mantle material. And so when a small body hits a big body, part of it merges and part of it is, is escaped as ejecta. Almost all of the ejecta is mantle material. And so you end up increasing the core mantle mass fraction during a partial accretion event, a little. But then you do it over time. Okay. And so the, the original embryos uh, began with a third core mass fraction. 
And this is the distribution of how their core mass fraction evolved, I mean ended, um, for the 200 planets. And the black histogram, the gray histogram are all planets and the black histogram are the largest planets. And, um, and the associated data are the mass of debris for each planet can be substantial. And so this is a sense of during the giant impacts that are growing the planet, you will create debris. Uh, and the mean here was about 20% of the final mass for the largest planets is in debris. But there's a very flat histogram here. So there's a range. Some of that material will be re-accreted, but the n-body simulations show that not all of the planetesimals are accreted. Some will be scattered out. They are, because they're ejected, they're on re-intersecting orbits. So they have a very high probability of re-accreting. And the only way they wouldn't is if they had a gravitational interaction with some other body that tweaked its orbit. Or it was a small enough particle, say a vapor condensant for very high impact velocity events, that would allow it to be um, perturbed by non-gravitational forces like pointing Robertson drag if it were very small particles. OK. And so those, th that would be mechanisms that would let you change the bulk composition. Um, and, and so these are calculable for n-body simulations if you have the computing power to track all of this debris, which will require a different style code. It will require a code that has n bodies in addition to some statistical treatment of the small bodies, because you can't keep track of each one individually. And there are codes in development, and they're referenced in your notes, that try and do this, these hybrid statistical n body codes. OK. And um, the fraction, and so this is just the size distribution of final planets, so the bigger ones are out here. OK. Um, we did not try to uh, keep track of so the range of outcomes. Collisional erosion was brought up yesterday. So you know, some of what I put in here was to address this aspect of collisional erosion. What we calculated in this core to mantle fraction is, is a mantle, is a two layer planet. And crust is nowhere near resolved. But you can imagine that some fraction that's ejected is, is crust. It's tiny. <laughs> and whether or not it could contribute to, there is a hypothesis in the literature, 2008 paper by O'Neill and Palm, Palm um, that uh, the Earth is slightly enriched in iron to magnesium ratio compared to chondrite solar, and um, that there is a depletion in uh, lithophile rare elements. And that could, and one mechanism that was proposed was collisional erosion because they had just seen the first hit and run models come out. Those only came out in the mid 2000s. Um, and the idea that there would be some outer material stripped in these hit and run events was perfectly reasonable and, and could be explored. And the question here primarily is, it, when do you have the right composition crust that you could lose? And does that even make sense? And that's an open question that people are working on. OK. Um, so this is a summary of things we know, things we need, more, more equations of state. I'll get back to things that we need in just a minute. I'm going to skip thermodynamics. <laughs> OK, thermodynamics of giant impacts. Everyone wants to know how much melts. There are a couple of papers in the literature that attempted to do this before we had beautiful n-body simulations of planet formation. Um, these papers you could start with. This is in the Origin of the Earth book, and this is in JGR. And here, um, these were, not, these were uh, basically Calculations of melt production scaled up from impact cratering events, where we have a better idea of what's going on. So the idea is that the energy is deposited near the impact point, and you have a core of volume that's fully melted, partially vaporized, and then the pressure, the shock pressures decay with distance rapidly so that the opposite hemisphere is not shock and melted at all. Um, and then there's the gravitational reequilibration. The drawing, whenever you see a cartoon like this with contours of shock pressure, this is the initial position of the material, of course. And there's great displacement of material into its final configuration. And so Tonks and Malosh paper talk about forming um, sort of a zone of melt and then the gravitational reequilibration of that forming some depth magma oceans. And they address the question of how deep magma oceans could you make from different giant impacts. This has now all been superseded by modern um, SPH style calculations that one could more directly calculate temperatures and the amount of melting or entropy 
if you believe the codes. And the problem is that the codes are still lacking a number of things to allow us to do this calculation accurately. For one, um, the mantle is modeled as a single mineral, usually forced to write, with an equation of state that's still missing in some key aspects, like the melting curve. And, <laughs> um, and so it's a very simple numerical treatment of the mantle, and we'd like to do much, much better. But that involves gathering the data but converting it into a format that a code can use, which is a non-trivial step. The decay of the shock wave is strongly influenced by whether or not the material is fluid or solid. And everyone is calculating fluids. And so you have a much steeper decay if it's solid, and that's currently being neglected in the codes. And so this is why, oh so, I'll admit that a year and a half ago, if you had asked me how much of the Earth melted during the moon forming impact, I would have said all of it. And now, as I'm trying to estimate the amount of melt, I'm, I'm less sure, and those are the reasons why I'm less sure. It's because these are key factors that are being left out of the codes that I don't know that I can neglect yet until we do more work. Okay. Um, I, I have uh, movies. <laughs> we are almost out of time. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to show two movies that address this question of mixing. Okay. So this is a, oops, I have to go back to the beginning. Um, this is a, uh, a, a standard late impact. This is a slightly bigger than Earth Earth, um, rotating quickly in this case, being hit by a half Mars mass body at 20 kilometers per second. This is a typical late giant impact, except the planet is, is spinning rather fast. And just watch the evolution of materials. And this is a proposed model for moon formation. We have this huge opening of the planet from the sort of crater formation, merging of the cores, and most of the red from the projectile gets deposited in the outer layers of the Earth, and in this case, a circumterrestrial disk. And so it does look like um, there's a lot of displacement of material. It's quite a violent event initially. It doesn't have the drama of late impacts like graze and merge. But the early stages of this event, here we are hours. We've opened up a crater practically down to the core. We're merging core materials. But then there's gravitational reaccumulation and sloshing, some spiral arms, and um, basically settling down here after just several hours. OK, so this is the time scale. And now you've got to think about melting. We got melting from shock, melting from gravitational accretion, and redistribution of materials. <coughs> So not all one thing to try and calculate. Um, I'm going to talk about where material started and where it ended to address Matt's mixing question. And so here, this is the word we use is provenance. This is the end state. Just think of it as a generic impact, but this corresponds to the simulation that I showed before, where you have a core, a lower mantle, an upper mantle, an atmosphere, in this case an extended silicate atmosphere, and a disk. A rotationally supported disk around the planet. And this is where the material originated in this fast impact. And the reds are, are particles that escaped. And so what I'm going to do is show you a movie that propagates this forward in time. But you already can see that material from the impacted hemisphere ends up being shocked and is the hottest. And it ends up in the outer layers just from gravitational reaccumulation with respect to their uh, densities. And the cores emerged. And the material that ends up in the lower mantle is from the less shocked area in the opposite hemisphere. And so what, uh, so there are a couple things you should know. I'm reminding you this is extremely low resolution calculation. SPH does not like to mix things very well. It's not a good code for trying to look at intimate mixing of materials. But I'm just making the point that a giant impact event does not blenderize a planet. Okay. And so the movie, I know it's not a word. <laughs> um, and so uh, we're starting at time zero. Watch the clock again. And we're going forward in time. We've got our big opening. And the hot stuff in the impacted hemisphere is wrapping around the planet. The cold stuff is redistributing itself around the middle. And we have material that's escaping and material that's going into a disk. OK, so these swirling egg movies. <laughs> um, uh, should give you a sense that there is great redistribution of material, but it's hard to get the impacted hemisphere to mix with the opposite hemisphere on the time scale of the event. Now you have to take this complicated end state with thermal gradients, some compositional gradients, and evolve that forward in time. So the question of mixing is not just did it melt. It's not just what was the total energy of impact. It's related to 
the time that you care about after the event. Okay. Um, I have open questions, mixing. So related to that point is that we have recent geochemical data that suggests that the Earth was not intimately mixed. That is not to say so. Um, you'll hear more about it this week, but we have uh, noble gas isotopes that indicate that there was a signature of heterogeneous secretion preserved. That is, these are isotope systems that um, are original to the solar nebula, <laughs> and um, and and have and there is a signature of an earlier accretion phase in the lower mantle preserved, and a different material being accreted later being preserved in the upper mantle. If I said that right. And hence, and the time that this occurred was very early on during the standard giant impact phase. So the implication is that giant impacts do not perfectly mix. That's not to say you can't dilute the original chemical reservoir, but we did not perfectly homogenize them. Sorry. Yes. Well, well, hidden is hard. Hidden is a hard thing, <laughs> um, but uh, certainly that hasn't been addressed. And if you had a very stable layer in the lower mantle, it's not clear where it would end up after a giant impact event. So I would say that these simulations do not bear upon very thin, very stable layers in the bottom of the mantle until we do more work. But on the bulk scale, you could say partial mixing. OK? Um, and so what we have now is linked chemistry with this dynamical period of Earth formation. Yes, he's trying to kick me off. Um, and, and this is exciting. This is new to the students. This is a very new development that we actually have signatures that we can attribute to the process that the Earth formed as opposed to thinking of the Earth as being reset after each impact event or reset after the moon forming impact event. So two years ago at AGU, there was the first 100 million year session. Everyone began with a homogeneous planet and developed all their chemical reservoirs. Now we have chemical reservoirs surviving during planet formation. This is a fundamentally different view of the early growth of the Earth. OK. Um, and the origin of the moon is subject to debate. I gave a talk about this last week. It's on the web, so I'm going to just skip it. I'm going to say what we need. Um, we need improved planet formation simulations, not just the fact that we need to capture the complexity of, of impacts that generate debris, but also understanding the giant planets. We need equations of state for real mantle materials <laughs> over a tremendous range of pressure, volume, temperature space. We need to have things that vaporize, things that stay in the, in the solid phase. It's a tremendously difficult problem to, to have data over all of the range that we need. We're going to need data and theory because we're not going to be able to um, get experiments everywhere we need. Um, although new facilities uh, like lasers and other high energy density facilities are able to achieve equivalent impact velocities of 40 kilometers per second. So we can achieve very high shock states. We need to get this equation of state information in a format that codes can use and include these other aspects. I didn't even talk about multi-phase flow as part of the problem of how materials are merging and mixed. And the, the way to think about the accretion process is the time-dependent model of thermal evolution. I like Dave's term, the healing of the Earth in between giant impacts. What is happening? The notes have a reference to magma ocean crystallization time being less than the average time between giant impacts. And so it's a very interesting period of planet formation. I <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> No, no, no. You should have coffee. I'm here all week, but I'm leaving at, at the weekend. Yes. This one was uh, an isentrope um, just around the solidus um, because one expects that in between the giant impacts, you cool to near the solidus and not much below that. And so that there's some sensitivity to that, but compared to all the other unknowns, it's not tremendously sensitive. Of course, it matters if you want to calculate how much melts, but in terms of the dynamics and other things, not so sensitive. Yes. 
the um, M body simulations generally produce an inner planet that's a lot more massive than uh, Mercury. Uh, can this discrepancy be explained just by um, collisional erosion? Possibly. I mean, I don't. I we won't know until we actually run new simulations with more realistic collision outcomes. But if I, I, you either need to truncate the inner part of the disk, which is possible, um, or you need to have it be less efficient at accreting. And but but Mercury still has the extra problem of uh, large core, not just its mass. So you you can grow a twice as big as Mercury body there, but then you have to invoke a happenstance event to get rid of half of it. Oh, about 2.2 times present day. It becomes like Mars. Um, I mean, the n-body simulations are really not trying to address Mercury yet. So anything there is by accident, and they haven't tweaked anything to try and improve the situation yet. Okay. Yes? Oh, the, the provenance one? Yeah, and... Um, yes. Well, I mean, yes. There's a paper that goes with this. Um, oh, you mean the this one? Okay, so this is um, an alternative moon formation model that begins with a very fast spinning Earth, and um, the idea is that it's an impact-induced fission to make the lunar disk be similar composition as the Earth. So what we, this goal of this was to try and have the ratio of red particles from the projectile to the green particles from the Earth um, be similar to what in the disk be similar to what's in the Earth, and and you can see as in as I pointed out earlier, you can see that the projectile Mantle materials are preferentially deposited in the outer layers, although this is exaggerated because it's a, I, such a low resolution calculation. Uh, um, well, what difference between ocean island results and more of our. Uh, presumably, well, if you think that the difference. Um, so, one. Depending on the mixing rate between giant impacts, you could interpret this as the newer material is preferentially deposited in the outer layers. And so if we're sampling something in the deep mantle like the Ocean Island neon, um, noble gas data, that would be a record of earlier accretion rather than later accretion. And that, that material was in the lower mantle before such an impact, and some of that material remained in the lower mantle and was not well mixed with the stuff above it. And so loosely, you could say that something like this would be consistent with that, but the details are not. But the age of orbit in the ocean island is all the high average, the mean age is two billion years. So we're talking about something that happens way after. The mean age of so eruptions? Right. The current reservoirs have evolved since the accretion phase of planet formation, and yet reserve, preserve a trace of this period. Is that the right way to say it? <laughs> Something happened here, but they've evolved significantly since then. Yes, that is a good point. We are looking through the filter of four and a half billion years of lots of activity on the Earth. Yeah. Sarah, just a question. Can these n-body simulations keep track or calculate the spin rates of the planet? Yes. There are two papers that have looked at this in detail, Agnors 99 and Kokubo Anita, and they find very fast spin rates, and that's artificially pumped up by perfect merging. But given the frequency of graze and mer grazing events between similar size uh, impacts, you would expect the, the models predict high angular momentum. Right. So what fraction of the planets would have the spin rates that you needed to get that alternative moon? Um, is that unusual? Is that No, it's, uh, so in the most recent paper that kept track of it, the average annual momentum of Earth mass planets was 2.7 times the present day with a distribution from one to, to, to spin instability to three. And so it's, there's a distribution of probabilities of spins and they're all greater than today.
I mean, most of it is greater than today. The spin states of planets, all of them, well, all the terrestrial ones, are, are quite modified from their original value. I mean, Mercury is in resonance, and Venus, something happened, and we have the moon, and something happened. And so the spin states are not necessarily original. <sighs> OK. And so um, if the giant impact stage, uh, so prior to our understanding of the giant impact stage, the spin states of planets were predicted to be much slower, and we were actually spinning too fast. With the impact, giant impact stage modeling, um, the spin rates are, are fast for all the planets. Uh, right, so there should be isotropic tilt, and so there's some reason why we don't all, ha why we have a rather low obliquities. Yeah. Yes. Wow. But but we don't but but you don't overinterpret that. <laughs> in my in my list in my notes and then the skipped slides is the question of uh, core equilibration with the mantle, which I leave as an open question that that we really haven't worked that out. All right, fantastic lines. <laughs> Eleven o'clock.